Uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Axioma and the museum for inviting me. Um, it's always a real pleasure to come here. As I said, I've been coming for a few years and it always produces um, really interesting and enjoyable conversations. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Um, tonight I'm going to be talking about some of the stuff from this, uh, which is my book, um, and talking about some of the ideas in that, uh, why I think they're interesting, maybe important, um, and, uh, and also just right at the end, like where I'm sort of going with this, because this book's been out for almost a year now, it was involved a lot of thinking before that. Um, one of the things I do in the book is talk a lot of, about some very dark things, uh, really bad stuff. Um, but in the book, I, I very deliberately avoided trying to seek answers to any of the questions that it raises. Um, because I think before we can meaningfully seek answers um, and, or anything even resembling solutions, even just strategies for moving forward, we need to see very clearly where we actually are in the present. This book is largely about trying to take a clear view on exactly where we are before we're ca even capable of thinking about possible solutions to it. But a year on, I'm starting to think about those things, both through the exhibition Axioma and, and through a couple of things I might say at the end. Um, but I'll start by explaining some of the kind of central uh, precepts of the book. For me, something interesting happens around here. This is a book from 1922, um, but it, the story that it tells goes back a, a little bit earlier. Um, this book's called Weather Forecasting by Numerical Processes, um, and it's a book by a guy called Lewis Fry Richardson. Richardson was a super interesting guy. Um, he was an English meteorologist, so he studied the weather. Uh, and before the war, before the First World War, he was working in an um, observatory in Scotland, gathering data about the weather, trying to understand what was happening in the atmosphere. And he had this idea that if we could only gather enough information about, about the world, um, we'd be able to model it we'd be able to write certain equations, certain pieces of mathematics, which would allow us to take what we knew about the world and predict what would happen to it over time. Um, and of course, he was doing this in the domain of the weather. And when he, he was also quite, I, I found this super interesting, he was also, he was a Quaker uh, and a pacifist, um, which meant that when he was called up for the war, he was a conscientious objector. He refused to fight, he joined an ambulance unit so he spent the First World War uh, on the Western Front um, uh, as carrying stretchers, tending to the wounded, wounded and uh, working on his meteorological theories. He took a whole bunch of this data that had been gathered. Uh, in fact, data had been gathered on a single day, on May 20th, 1910. Um, meteorologists, weather observers all across Europe gathered all the, they watched the weather really closely across that whole day, and all that information was gathered into a single data set. And when Richardson went off to war, he took a copy of that. And he spent the war years figuring out, trying to make mathematical relationships between these numbers. And he figured out a bunch of equations that he thought would allow him to predict the weather. And that's what he published in this book in 1922. But he performed the full forecast of the weather during the war with pencil and paper. Um, behind, behind the trenches, often even under fire or kind of while, while sheltering. Um, and it was largely successful. He worked out a mathematical model for predicting the weather. Um, and he did it because there were no computers at this time with pen and paper. Um, to do a full 24-hour forecast of the weather at that time took him, he reckoned, about eight months. Right? So to, in order to predict the weather 24 hours ahead took him eight months. Um, and as I say, it was done with pen and paper, because in those days, um, computers were people, essentially. Uh, in fact, that's what we used to call people who did complex mathematics. We used to call them computers. That name only got applied to machines when we built the machines 50 years later. Um, but but uh, Richardson believed that this was a, a viable model. He didn't actually believe it would ever be possible. In the book, he actually describes what it would take uh, at that time to create a forecast uh, fast enough to run at the speed of weather. He imagined this kind of huge architecture filled with hundreds, if not thousands, of people. This is a, a painting from the 1980s, but based on the description in his book, where he describes what it would take, how many computers 
i.e. people, it would take to do all of the calculations to run his weather forecasting algorithm faster than the weather actually occurred. And he writes in his report that perhaps someday in the dim future, it will be possible to advance the computations faster than the weather advances, and it would cost less than the saving to mankind due to the information gained. But that is a dream. Um, and Richardson never saw this really come to pass, but um, it didn't actually remain a dream forever. These are the instructions for a computer called the ENIAC, which in 1950 was used to run the very first mechanical computational forecast of a day's weather, uh, this time for the continental United States. But it took the same approach. There's a map, you divide it into squares, you reduce it to these kind of fixed units of data, you build this kind of data set, and then you perform mathematical uh, operations on that data to move the timeline forward, essentially to predict the future. You're predicting the future for this model you've created of the world, this kind of abstraction of it. Um, but it basically works. They, they used Richardson's methods, slightly updated, um, but, but basically exactly the same methods based on pressure and, 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 and wind and, 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 and all these kind of measurements they've made. And it took, instead of four months in 1940, it took them um, five weeks to perform a complete day's forecast, which is a pretty huge increase, even though it's still obviously a lot longer than a day. Um, but these, these computers, early computers from the 1940s, were hugely temperamental, and they required a lot of kind of fiddling with, they broke down a lot. Um, but when John von Neumann, who was the lead scientist on this program, totted up like the logs of how long the computer had been running for, he discovered that the actual running time of the computer to do this calculation was 23 and a half hours, right? So just under a day. And he wrote in the report that Richardson's dream of advancing computation faster than the weather may soon be realized. And it was, as, as, as we know today, we now run computers faster than the world itself, right? Because we can predict the weather further and further ahead over the last 50, 60 years since the ENIAC, we've gone from, you know, it, well, in Richardson's time, it took four months to predict today. By the 1940s, that had crept up to within a few days. And over the next few decades, it accelerated and accelerated out. So now we're capable of predicting, um, predicting the future ahead, essentially by running computers faster than the world itself, which is a, a pretty extraordinary achievement, but it has been done as part of the way in which computation itself has expanded, and this belief that by gathering as much information about the world, by assembling these huge data sets, performing mathematical operations on them, we can create this kind of perfect model of the world. As I said earlier, Richardson was a Quaker, he was a pacifist, and he actually left, he joined the weather service in the UK after, his, after the war, um, and, and well, that's when he released his book, but shortly after that, the um, the weather office, the meteorological office, was uh, merged into the Ministry of War. Um, so he left again because he was a pacifist. Um, but the reality of his vision, what actually happened, was only achieved through military technologies. Um, this is the reality of Richardson's computer hall, that beautiful dome that I showed before. This is a picture of the ENIAC, which is the computer that performed the first calculation. Um, the ENIAC, this is it installed in um, a place called the Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland in the US. The Aberdeen Proving Grounds is an artillery range because the ENIAC was originally developed to um, uh, calculate artillery trajectories to make more accurate weapons, essentially. Um, and shortly after that, its second task was to calculate the yield of atomic bombs. Um, computers, all the computers that we use all the time, by which I mean this, by which I mean your phone, by which I mean your camera, by which I mean everything that has computational devices inside it, descends from these machines, which were designed essentially for two purposes, to, um, to develop atomic weapons and to predict the weather. Those are the, the, the original functions of computers, their first kind of two tasks. Despite my feelings about military technologies and how awful a lot of that history is. I'm also a massive nerd, and I, I love this computer. It's one of my favorite ones, um, because there's something really extraordinary about this machine. The ENIAC was 
was this machine that kind of took up two rooms, these kind of huge spaces, uh, and in which you could... Th there's a lovely thing that was said by Harry Reid, a, a mathematician who worked on the original ENIAC, which is that he said, um, he said, the ENIAC was strangely a very personal computer. Right? Today we think of a personal computer as something like this, <coughs> that you carry around with you, but the ENIAC was a personal computer because you lived inside it. Right? Like you kind of inhabited it in this very direct way. And, and it's true that even though it was a very complex machine, you could, you could stand in that room and you could watch computation happen. You could see by the process of lights moving around the room and by the sound of relays switching, you could actually follow a mathematical process as it moved around that room. And of course, computation hasn't really shrunk either. There's this idea, again, we've gone from the ENIAC to this, that it's all kind of compacted down in size. But of course, the, the opposite is true. Computation has actually expanded to include the entire globe. Um, computation takes place at the scale of the planet itself and kind of vast buildings housing computers in data centers, fiber optic cables that run under the ocean, even satellites that go out into space. The computer that Harry Reid lived inside is the machine that we all live inside today. And as a result of living inside that machine in this way, we've also taken on its way of thinking. Uh, this way of thinking that if you just gather enough data, if you just model the world, in a sufficiently in-depth way, if you have enough numbers, if you reduce everything down to numbers, you can calculate and predict with total certainty, and thus predict the future, and thus control it. And so much of our present world is based on this belief that we can perfectly predict and thus control the future. But this is clearly an increasingly distressingly not true. One of the starting points for, uh, for, for writing my book was reading about um, uh, what's currently happening to weather forecasting. So as I said, weather forecasting is this model of how we've got out uh, this, this, this kind of horizon of prediction, how we've managed to push out to a week, 10 days, 15 days, of being able to look forward based on the data that we have um, in order to be able to predict what's going to happen in the atmosphere. But unfortunately, uh, very seriously, and mostly due to climate change, that horizon is actually reducing. This is a um, modeling of, of, of specifically of, of upper atmosphere turbulence over the North Atlantic, which is directly attributable to climate change. So what's happening is as the atmosphere warms and cools, differently in different places at different rates. It's producing higher differentials of temperature and pressure in the upper atmosphere. And as these layers of warm and cold air move against each other more chaotically, they produce different weather, particularly more extreme weather, and also they literally produce turbulence. The next time you're on a flight and it feels more bumpy than you remember flights used to be, that's a direct result of climate change. The future is going to be bumpy. And it's also, crucially, going to be less predictable. Our ability to predict the weather is degrading. It's getting worse. After a century of this computation, this modeling and prediction, our ability to use machines and data to predict the future is starting to come apart. It's starting to fall. And we're looking, in the present and in the future, about a world about which we can know less. Well, the, one of the people I was reading about this, the chairman of a, um, uh, the largest US weather forecasting company, wrote, a, wrote an essay in which he talked about the idea that we might already have passed through peak knowledge about the world. In the way that we might already have passed through peak oil, we might already have reached a point at which we can know the most about the world and be moving away from that once again. We're used to seeing so many graphs like this, right, that go up and to the right, uh, that are about progress and, and the future and everything getting better. This isn't one of those graphs. Uh, this is a graph of uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide as measured uh, constantly for um, uh, over 50 years now at the Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii. Um, I'm sure you've all seen this graph. Um, it's the graph that shows that, you know, a couple of years ago we passed 
um, 400 parts per million. Uh, we're now at a higher uh, concentration of, of atmospheric CO2 than we've been at for thousands and thousands of years. Um, this, is, this is the situation that we're in. Um, what we don't often think about CO2 is it's not just uh, warming the planet, it's actively affecting the way that we think. Um, at higher levels of carbon dioxide, the human brain, uh, again, degrades in its cognitive ability. Uh, 400 parts per million sounds a lot, but inside a warm, stuffy room like this, uh, it often reaches 1,000 parts per million. CO2 in this room is a lot higher than it's going to be out there in the environment. At 1,000 parts per million, your ability to think drops by 20%. Your ability to perform complex reasoning, right? Uh, global warming and climate change is actively making us dumber. It's making it harder for us to think about these complex problems that we face. And this is in complete contrast to everything we thought we knew about technology and the way, the way it would enable us to think better and more clearly. And it's these kind of problems that I'm obsessed with addressing because we have to face the evidence that's right there in front of us. This is a graph of um, uh, Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is, um, it, crucially it's not a law, but it's an observation that has held true for kind of 50 years now. Uh, Moore's Law was invented by um, a guy called Moore, who worked for, I think it was IBM, I may be wrong about that. Um, he, said, he said that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit would double every year. Right? What that means is computers would double in power every year. And that has held true for 60 years. And this upward curve of the power of machines has kind of underpinned most of the kind of vast technological <coughs> expansion of the 50, last 50 years. This belief that we'll always have more power in these devices, we'll always be able to solve more problems. And of course this completely mimics uh, the kind of everything from the enlightenment of kind of scientific process and the growth of knowledge and, and, and this kind of belief that we progress inevitably towards this kind of sunlit uplands of human knowledge um, and, and understanding. And as I say, this has held true for, for, uh, for more than 50 years. And as a result, it's become a kind of moral law. We believe that this is the way the world actually works. Just as our use of things like weather prediction or complex military technologies has made us believe that the world actually is data that can be, that can be written down, that can be recorded, reduced, as I say, to data, deployed, predicted, calculated. These things have settled into our brains in such a powerful way that we can't really imagine anything else. We see the world as though we and it are all forms of computers, that everything is computational in this way. And yet more and more, this approach is revealing the fact that this actually isn't the case at all. Um, this is one of the many interesting results uh, from, from the sciences uh, that, that seem to be showing this. So um, this is a, a graph that shows the discovery of medicine over the last 60, 70 years against the amount of money that's been spent on discovering new medicines. Uh, we're discovering fewer and fewer new drugs and despite spending vast, vast more money on it. And there's arguments around why this is happening. But one of the arguments and the reason that this graph has been called by scientists a room's law, which is Moore's law backwards, is because one of the reasons we seem to be discovering less and less is because we've treated it as a computational problem. So if you imagine the sort of places where uh, chemists discover new drugs, like, it sounds silly, but we all do imagine a little bit, those kind of huge labs with people in white coats and like bubbling glassware and that kind of like, you know, scientific realm of discovery. If you go to a pharmacological laboratory now, you'll see something that looks more like the modern version of the ENIAC essentially like a data center. You'll see huge automated machines going through huge libraries of chemi chemicals, trying to match them and testing the results. And it turns out that this approach, this computational approach of pure mathematics, isn't producing the results that we think it would. There's something different about the way in which computers model and predict the world and humans model and predict the world. That means as a result of this, Lots of drug companies are going back to building small teams of people who follow hunches, who explore the problem space in a different way in order to kind of produce different results. Because we're 
we're very susceptible, as I say, to believing in computers in this way. There's something very... Um, there's a really weird thing I discovered reading the book, and I read a bunch of papers about it, which is called Automation Bias, which maps onto this really well. Which is essentially that, you know, our brains are, are pretty extraordinary. They're also surprisingly lazy, right? And they will actually take any kind of shortcuts that they're offered. One of the big problems with this is a thing called automation bias. Automation bias is the fact that just however smart you are, however smart you are, um, and this has been tested on airline pilots, on, on uh, airline pilots always held up as the people with the most training and the kind of smarts in this kind of situation. They put airline pilots under simulated extreme conditions in which everything they know tells them how to solve a problem and then they get a computer to suggest a really bad idea to them. But because it comes from the computer, the airline pilots immediately take it. And this has been replicated across multiple, multiple domains. And this is called automation bias. And it's basically if you put a machine in between humans and their decision making, humans follow the machine's idea quicker than they'll follow their own, not even intuition, their own kind of deep knowledge and understanding of the situation. This is also something that underlies, um, I think, uh, a phenomenon that's become known as death by GPS where people are willing to follow the, um, the directions from their onboard computer into places like Death Valley or even driving directly into the sea because it shows them that there is a path ahead that they can follow. Humans are, it seems at this point, capable of ignoring all of their own senses if they are given contradictory instructions by a machine. Um, and that's something that's, that's deep in our brains. Um, uh, and we need to become more aware of in order to be able to actually make our own decisions and have some kind of autonomy in the world. But this, this effect is playing out, of course, not just in the sciences, not just in kind of psychological experiments, but across the whole of society, right? And particularly in, in our politics. This inability to actually to be able to tell the difference uh, or make meaningful uh, decisions about you know, what information is useful to us or how it's being provided to us, as I'm sure we're all aware, playing out in really weird ways in politics. Um, this building, if you haven't seen a picture of this before, is the headquarters of something called the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. In this building, a lot of people who may or may not be paid by the Russian government, but are certainly paid by someone, spend all their day uh, uploading information to the internet, pretending to be people uh, uh, of certain political persuasions, preparing computer programs that also release this information, uh, putting this information out into the world in places that we encounter it and have to make sense of it in some way. And just in the way that the human brain has not yet evolved to deal with things like automation bias, we haven't evolved our brains in order to be able to deal with the vast amounts of conflicting information that are presented to us constantly by um, by the internet and also um, by our mass media, by the experience of travel, by, by the level of the world as it really is. Because it's also, I mean, it's not just the Russians who are doing this, and I'll give a couple of examples, um, but also it's, it's, it's not just the idea that there's some kind of malign influence at work. Um, it's very interesting when you read interviews with people who've worked within these systems of propaganda, is they don't really believe that anyone's mind can be changed. Um, they're not, that's not actually their stated goal. Their stated goal is to set out to confuse us, to present us with so much information that we believe as humans that we're not even capable of kind of engaging with it meaningfully and therefore we withdraw and we refuse to actually participate um, in, in the debates that are, that are around this. Um, and if you think about the, the way in which the world largely feels right now, um, the, the main symptoms for humans of being kind of overwhelmed by information are fear, and often anger, and a kind of confusion and a desire for, to, to, to withdraw from this kind of confusing position that's presented to us. That's what this political project is setting out to do at the moment. Because we're so, so easy to fool. This is another social example of the, the kind of death by GPS example. Um, in the summer of 2015, uh, this website, AshleyMadison.com, was hacked. If you're not familiar with Ashley Madison, it was a, a dating website for people who wanted to have affairs. Uh, yeah, you signed on, you tried to find someone to have an affair with who was not your partner. Um, someone hacked this and released all of the details online. Um, that was 37 million accounts had been created on this website. Um, 
And of course, when this leaked, people went through all this data to try and figure out what was going on. And it turned out, and this possibly is not so surprising, there was a huge discrepancy between the numbers of each gender that was represented on the site. Of those 37 million members, only 5 million were women, and the vast majority of those had just created an account, logged in once, and then left immediately. What there was was a few thousand incredibly active accounts that were sending thousands, if not tens of thousands of messages every day to other users. It's pretty obvious that those accounts were completely automated. Right? So what you had was several million men trying to persuade pieces of software to have sex with them. That was the system that was in operation here. And while it's best that that's where they spent their energies, it says something fairly terrifying about our ability to sort between these different personas, these different pieces of information. If we can't do it within the realm of personal relationships, our chance of doing it at the level of politics is almost impossible. And this is being actively manipulated. So it's not just, um, and not just for political gain either. Obviously the, the primary way in which this is being manipulated is for commercial gain. Um, this is one that actually occurred to me just recently. Right? I'm watching a video of Walter Cronkite, the US news anchor, uh, talking seriously and realistically about climate change on television. In, in, this is back in 1980, right? We've known about this thing for a while. He's talking seriously about it. It's really interesting. Um, but because of the way in which we've designed these technologies to provide us with information, but it's been done by largely corporate interests, um, this is what YouTube says you should follow that video with. Right? 38 years, and this is where we're at, going from this position of clear, meaningful information to, to conspiracy theory and something completely made up and, and increasingly confusing. Someone recently described this to me in a really interesting way, um, which he said that, um, he said that imagine the internet is like a, a, a kind of a control system for a city, and it notices that there's a car crash. And it notices also that everyone slows down to look at the car crash. And so this algorithm goes, wow, people really love car crashes. Let's crash some more cars. Right? That is essentially what's happening with systems like this. They're being trained essentially towards our absolute worst impulses. And so encouraging the more creation. So you can start looking at climate change information on these systems and you can end up going down very deep and uh, quite extreme kind of rabbit holes. I spent quite a lot of time looking at this in terms of, and I write about it in the book, in terms of what this was doing to particularly children's videos. Um, so on YouTube you have millions and millions of children basically being babysat by YouTube being given what starts out as very innocuous content, but because of this same tendency towards more and more extreme content, uh, even very small children are slowly channeled towards content that exacerbates kind of violence uh, and, and sexual content, stuff that's wildly inappropriate for small children. Um, and so while I'll talk about some of the political and uh, kind of social aspects of this, it's really important to bear in mind, uh, and we'll continue to, there's also very large companies profiting from this in very intense ways. And the solutions to this are in no way easy. Um, but I'm pretty sure we can start by saying that no one should be making huge amounts of money from this kind of manipulation. Because, as I say, we're really, really, really bad at dealing with this kind of information. <coughs> but I feel it underpins a huge amount of what's happening in the present day. Um, because... The internet, for all of its beauty and extraordinary wonder, uh, and as I say, also other forms of modern technology, mass media, travel, um, present us constantly with a world that we find it very difficult to integrate, we find it very difficult to understand. The thing is, I don't think that's a problem of information. Um, I, I, I think this is really super important. The world has always been complex. The world is is difficult to understand. Um, and it's composed of all kinds of kind of strange and paradoxical elements, right? Um, and we, we have to confront it. We've spent our entire civilization, our entire species history, building tools to bring us into greater contact with more and more of this reality, right? But along the way, we've also built these really weird beliefs about the world because of those tools. Like this belief 
that technology alone will provide us with information that will converge upon simple and easy to understand solutions. That it will provide us the answers rather than giving us tools through which to see it. At the moment when presented with the vast complexity of information on the internet right, and in the world around us, which was supposed to lead us towards better decision making, towards a clearer view of the world, increasingly seems to confuse us. And despite having access to all this information, we see all around us a world that is increasingly defined by fundamentalism, by division, by uncertainty, by fear, and by anger. These are the dominant emotions of the world at present. And so we need some other way of accommodating ourselves with what is the reality. You know? Because all of these things, like the, the, the pharmacological example, like the weather example, they're not showing us a world that's, that's necessarily itself confused. It's our understanding, our ability to approach it in a meaningful way, to acknowledge the uncertainty and complexity of the world itself that's, that's the problem. But rather than doing that, what we're mostly doing is creating tools to make it more complex and confusing, um, of which this is this kind of example. If you've kind of been watching what's happening with, with AI and um, machine learning and so on and so forth in recent years, we've seen things like this. This is um, an artificial intelligence system for generating uh, images of people. Uh, all of these images that you're seeing being generated here are um, completely uh, imaginary people. They don't exist. Uh, these aren't photographs, these are AI imaginings of entirely new and imaginary people. Um, and we're right at the point where uh, we're actually able to generate even more convincing realities. That we're, as if you weren't already, and I hope, already don't necessarily believe that everything you see is real in photographs or the news or whatsoever, we're actively creating tools that are going to make it much, much, much harder for us to do this. So it's absolutely essential that we develop skills very, very quickly to be able to actually operate in this world where the, the computational reality that's presented to us at all times um, is not one that we, that we can in any way trust. Uh, we need a very different way of thinking about the world and we need it fast. One of the examples I go to to think about and to try and explain this a bit um, and also possibly, which is I'm nearing the end and moving towards Again, really clearly, not solutions, because I do not have them at this point, but a clearer understanding of these things. This is, this is one of my favorite go-to examples. Um, this is the moment um, back in 1997 um, when Kasparov loses at chess to Deep Blue. Right, this is this super, super interesting thing that happens. Sure. So IBM built, builds a supercomputer specifically to beat this guy, the best human at chess ever, um, which is just mean. Um, and they do this to prove that because, because at this point chess is held up as the ultimate kind of human mental activity. And I think, right, this is the thing that will show that machines kind of ultimately outpace um, humans. And they do it, and you can see how pissed off he is about this. And at the time, we all were as humans. Like, it was a really weird moment when everyone was like, like, okay, that's it. Like, we're done. Like, the machines are going to take over. And that's, that's the kind of future for us. Um, uh, but there's two super interesting things that actually happened here. Um, the first thing is, we understand how Deep Blue did it, right? Deep Blue was just a very powerful computer. What it did was, it, it looked at the game board and calculated every possible move that was going to happen and it kind of searched between them to see what was the most effective. And it basically had more processing power than the human brain, so it could imagine and predict the game further ahead. It was just more powerful than the brain, um, but it was very brain-like in the way that it did it. Second really interesting thing that happened here is, as, as angry as Kasparov was, um, he came back the next year with an entirely different kind of chess, uh, something that he called advanced chess. Advanced chess is humans and computers playing chess together, which wasn't what happened before. It was humans versus humans or humans versus computers. But Kasparov proposed, well, what happens if the humans and the computers work together? The answer is super interesting things. It turns out that um, while today a computer much less powerful than Deep Blue will beat the best human player alive, 
a human working with a not particularly powerful computer will beat the most powerful supercomputer. Something happens in the combination of human and machine intelligence that produces entirely different and unexpected outcomes. That this, this, this distinction, this division we talk about, this, things like automation bias, where we give over all of our kind of belief to the world, and also what I haven't been calling, but I often call computational thinking, this belief that the world is reducible to data, is not necessarily the one sole vision we have to take. Other paths exist between it. But as I say, it's getting kind of weirder. Um, fast forward to last year, um, after we kind of gave up trying to um, win at chess, we were like, it's okay, we've still got Go, right? So Go is, is this ancient Chinese um, board game that's way more complex than chess and was believed, again, for a long time. It's like, oh, it's okay, humans are good at Go, the computers will never get there. So, of course, Google was like, we will beat the humans. And they spent years building an incredibly advanced computer, <coughs> much more advanced than Deep Blue, to beat some of the best human players. And they called this machine AlphaGo. And this is the moment in the game when uh, this famous match, uh, I think two years ago now, between Lisa Dole, one of the best human Go players, and AlphaGo. Um, AlphaGo plays this, the first two games out of five are quite evenly matched. And the third game, about halfway through, AlphaGo plays this move and the commentators are literally struck dumb. They go silent. They're just like, they can't understand what they've seen. And initially they think it's made a mistake. They're like, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense at all. And it's only after another kind of 10 moves or so that this is revealed to be one of the most extraordinary Go moves that has ever been played. Like in the whole history of Go, hundreds and hundreds of years, this, this, get, this move is already amongst one of the most famous. And it becomes clear that this move completely won the game, destroys the opponent, but isn't even visible to the humans for multiple moves. And moreover than that, unlike Deep Blue, where we were possible, where it was possible for us to kind of unpack the machine and see what decisions it was making, with AlphaGo, the way in which it's built, this thing called machine learning, the thing that we often hear about as artificial intelligence. <coughs> probably better described as machine intelligence because it's nothing like the kinds of intelligence, human or animal, that we're familiar with. It doesn't explain itself to us. We actually can't know why it makes the decisions that it makes. So the reasons behind this move will forever remain unknowable to us as humans. We've created now a form of intelligence which lives separately to us. So the challenges of like, what would advanced Go look like, right? What would it mean to cooperate with a machine like this is a very different question because we're cooperating with something that we know we cannot fully understand, which for me has deep resonances with these questions of how do we live amongst large, complex systems like the internet, which, again, we cannot fully understand. How do we live with large, complex systems like the environment? which we cannot fully understand, and yet we have to live you know, within them in this really clear way. There's no outside to these complex systems that we're now embedded in, that we find, must find kind of alternative strategies for. That's a few of the things from the book. Because I'm really fed up now of telling these really dark stories, I want to say three things right at the end um, that are not solutions, to be clear. They're maneuvers. Um, I'm still working out what that means. But there are three things I'm thinking about as ways to start thinking about this. Forms of Kasparov-type advanced <coughs> play that might do something. So consider this a little kind of coda conclusion to everything that I've said. This is actually the one that has the most relevance to the exhibition over at Axioma. This is a weird story that I just like. Think of it as a maneuver. This is a hexagon satellite, which is a US spy satellite. These things are crazy. Um, uh, they were designed in the 60s. They weren't declassified until 10 years ago, so no one even knew what these looked like until about 10 years ago, even though they'd been around since the 60s. Um, uh, one of the weird things about military computing in particular, but military intelligence and military secrecy in general, is that there's a lot of stuff in the world that we don't know about, right? That there's complete mystery to us because it's remained secret for so long. Satellites. The ability to see are a really good example of this. 
Because what happened is, just a couple of years ago, someone from the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, right, which is, um, you might have heard of like, you've got CIA and then you've got NSA, and then behind them you've got NRO, who are the guys who do all of the US satellite surveillance. They're kind of even more secret, and they have an even bigger budget because they put stuff into space. A guy from NRO kind of, this is how I imagine it happening, kind of sidled up to someone from NASA at a meeting and was like, do you want a couple of satellites? And NASA were like, what, what, what do you mean? Like, well, we've got these two satellites we don't need anymore. And it turned out that the National Reconnaissance Office had two satellites unused sitting in a warehouse which were better than the Hubble Space Telescope. Right? You've heard of Hubble, right? which is basically the or until very recently, it still is the best civilian space telescope we've ever launched. The NRO had two of these sitting on the shelf, unused. They've now given them to NASA. One of them will be launched in the next couple of years. It's something called WFIRST, the Wide, wide Field uh, Infrared Survey Telescope. These telescopes that were designed for looking down at us, right, for the purposes of surveillance and warfare, are being turned up and out to look for the origins of the universe, to understand more about the world, rather than essentially as weapons. That, for me, is the first necessary maneuver, to decide what it, what, what it is we want to do with these technologies and turn quite a lot of them around to look in the other direction. The other thing is these three words that I keep coming back to very strongly, which are distribute, decentralize, and educate. What I'm talking about when I talk about these is that the forms that technology has right now are not the forms that they have to have. It's not just a matter of turning them around, it's about rebuilding them from the ground up in different ways. And we can only do this if more and more people are involved in this. We have to be sure to be clear that this conversation we're having now, the conversation we have about technologies, is not just for the people who work on the technologies, or the people who claim to understand them, or the people who've always worked on them, which is a very small demographic. It's for everyone to be involved in this, and that involves education as well, uh, to an incredible level, to bring more and more people into this conversation. And that education can come in many ways, and from one of the ways that's coming for me slowly is through this emphasis on, on distribution and decentralization. I'll give a kind of core example of that. This is, um, again, if you're a nerd, famous diagram from the 1960s uh, by a guy called Paul Baran, who was one of the original engineers of the internet. Uh, it's called Centralized, Decentralized, and Distributed Networks. And these are the three types of networks. Um, and that's what we used to have when we had TV and radio and all those kind of things. Um, uh, there's a central thing that goes out to the edges. And on the right is what the internet is, was supposed to be. Right? That's where we were supposed to be heading towards decentralized networks. What we actually got stuck with was decentralized networks in the middle. We got stuck with a system where we're all connected, and it feels like we all have this power, but actually there's still big clumps there. Whether that's governments, whether that's large corporations, we're still fixed within those, um, within those groups. We haven't yet progressed to this kind of final um, distributed end. Um, and you can see these things, of course, as diagrams of political systems, just as you can of technological systems. Um, I happen to believe that by changing the nature of the technological systems on which we operate today, they don't magically change the political systems that run on them, but they give us a vocabulary with which to talk about. They allow people to think that they may be able to think about those other things too. I have a really stupid example for you, but I give it every time because I think it's important. If you're using a video chat with someone, right? If you're doing like <coughs> FaceTime or Skype with someone, you're talking to that person through the servers of a large company. That large company controls that conversation and that data. There are other tools out there, peer-to-peer -peer chat video systems that allow you to talk directly to that person, encrypted in different ways, distributed ways through the network. By doing so, you're not just taking away the power of that central node, you're actively changing the shape of the network itself. Through the tools that we choose to use, we're capable of reshaping those networks. And in order to do it, you go through a process of self-education in which you actually learn more about this system and are then capable of sharing that knowledge with other people. Anyone can learn and understand this stuff. It's not for specialists, it's not for abstruse debates. It's the absolute substrate on which 
We run our everyday lives, and it requires all of us to think clearly and consciously about the choices that we make around that. And the third manoeuvre, the third manoeuvre that I like to talk about is, um, I don't know, I call it like seeking common ground. Right? So um, this is a thing I made a couple of years ago. Um, it's a trap. Um, so I was thinking a lot about artificial intelligence systems, and I was thinking a lot about self-driving cars, and I built my own self-driving car, um, and then I tried to figure out if there was a way to trap it. And so what I did was I made this salt circle on the ground. And so what you have here is you have a, one solid line and one dashed line, which is the symbol for a no-entry street. Right? And so this self-driving car, um, which is programmed to obey the rules of the road, drives itself into the circle and then realizes it can't leave because it's surrounded by this no-entry circle. It's, it's nice. Um, but the thing is, well, and I made this because I wanted to point out that it's always possible to resist these technologies in certain ways, blah, blah, blah. But there's something else going on here, which is that this is the advanced chess move as well, right? Because it, while it's, it's possible to see this as a super aggressive act, right? I'm like blockading this thing, I'm tracking, trapping it. In order to think it through, in order to build it, I also had to sort of think myself into the machine. I had to find this space that both the human and the machine are seeing and inhabiting. The reason the circle works is because that circle is visible to both the human eye and to the machine's senses. I found this shared space in which both the human and the machine are operating, a space of actual possible dialogue and communication that isn't top-down, controlled by who built the software or the corporation or the government in control of it. I went in and found this common ground, the shared space. And we need more than ever to find these kind of shared spaces right now. Um, because as I've dropped into this conversation all along, AI, Facebook, Google, they're awful, but they're not the biggest threat either. <laughs> like climate change is coming down the line fast. And we need to be thinking seriously about ways of dealing with that as well. And I think, I think there's overlaps. I'm fascinated by the fact that we seem to be developing artificial intelligence just in the moment that we're also recognizing the intelligence of non-human animals. Just in the last kind of 10 years, we've started to see the fact that uh, whether it's apes, elephants, whales, whether it's cephalopods, kind of octopuses, cuttlefish squids, which are all kinds of weird, whether it's forests and ecological systems, they are also displaying complex intelligent-like behaviors that differ from ours. And so I ask again, like, what, is, what are our technologies doing? Um, because for me, seen rightly, they're not here as oppressive systems of control, though they're used as that, and we often mistake them for that. They're also here for us to also understand and think the world in kind of radically different ways. It seems really important that we're just at the moment that we're about to be kind of knocked off our perch of the intelligence tree by artificial intelligence, we're also starting to become possibly more and more aware of other ecological systems, complex ones that we've lived with all this time. And so if we're struggling with information systems on the one hand, maybe the tools we need to understand those are similar to the ones we need to understand and think about meaningfully complex ecological systems. So the, the central message as this, so I've been hinting at through the new dark age, is that I always use this phrase, the cloud is cloudy, right? The, the, by which I mean the fact that technology makes the world seem more complex is because the world really is more complex. And we've never been able to appreciate it so clearly as we're capable of dealing with it now. And while we're not dealing with it very well, and it feels like we're in this race for survival with capitalism, with the planet, with these tools being used against us, um, we can still retain the possibility of rethinking them in different ways, taking them up for other purposes, and seeing the world constantly anew through their lens. Um, and that, for me, is the, the challenge for, for me, for us, for all of us. That's enough. Thank you very much indeed.